Imagine a life completely free from the power grid. No more monthly electricity bills. No more worrying about blackouts during a storm. This is the story of how I, a woman of the Dine, or Navajo people, achieved that dream. My name is Anaba, and I live on the reservation in Arizona. Our land is vast, beautiful, and bathed in sun. Yet, for many of my people, reliable, affordable electricity is a constant struggle. The grid here is old and often fails. When a summer storm rolls in, the power is usually the first thing to go. My grandmother's stories are filled with the warmth of firelight and the community of shared resources. But in the modern world, being without power means being without so much. It means no refrigeration for food. No easy way to pump water. No lights for my children to study by after the sun sets. The monthly bill from the power company was a heavy burden. It was a bill that promised very little in return for its high cost. I felt trapped. I was paying for a service I couldn't depend on. I knew there had to be a better way, a path back to self-sufficiency. I started researching renewable energy, like so many people do. Solar power seemed like the obvious answer under our brilliant southwestern sky. But the initial cost was staggering. A full solar panel system for my home would cost tens of thousands of dollars. It was a financial mountain I simply could not climb. Wind power was another idea, but the consistent, strong winds weren't right for my specific location. I felt disheartened. The solutions felt just out of reach, designed for people with more money in their pockets. Then, one late night while searching online for alternatives, I stumbled upon a name. The name was Maxwell Chikambutso. He was an inventor from Zimbabwe. He claimed to have created revolutionary technology. He talked about a generator that could produce power from radio frequency waves. He said it could pull energy right out of the air around us. My first reaction was deep, profound skepticism. It sounded like science fiction, like magic. How could you get power from thin air? Wasn't that a perpetual motion machine, something science says is impossible? I am a practical person, grounded in the realities of the earth. This idea seemed too good to be true. But a small, hopeful part of me was incredibly curious. What if it was real? What if this was the key to unlocking our energy independence? I fell down a rabbit hole of research. I watched every video interview with Maxwell I could find. I read every article, even the ones that dismissed him as a fraud. The mainstream scientific community was, and still is, very critical of his claims. They say his devices violate the laws of thermodynamics. They say you can't get more energy out of a system than you put in. But then I would watch videos of his prototypes, like the electric helicopter and the green power generator, apparently working. I saw the passion in his eyes when he spoke about freeing Africa from energy poverty. His words resonated with me on a deep level. He spoke of empowerment, of self-reliance. These are values my people have held for generations. We believe in living in harmony with the earth, not just taking from it. The idea of harvesting ambient energy felt strangely in line with that ancient philosophy. It felt like listening to the quiet hum of the world and learning to use its song. After weeks of internal debate, I made a decision. I decided to take a chance. I found that his company, Seth Holdings Incorporated, was offering a product online. It was called the RF Powered Home Conversion Kit. The price was listed as $2,500. That was a significant amount of money for my family. It was a risk, I knew. But I calculated that it was less than two years of my expensive and unreliable grid power bills. If it worked, it would pay for itself quickly. If it didn't, it would be a hard financial lesson. I talked it over with my husband. He was even more skeptical than I was. He asked all the tough questions I had been asking myself. Where does the energy really come from? Is this a scam? What if it just doesn't work? But he also saw the desperate hope in my eyes. He saw my dream of a home that was truly our own, unshackled from outside forces. He agreed we should try. So, with a deep breath and a prayer to the holy people, I placed the order. The website was a little unpolished, which made me nervous. The checkout process felt less professional than a big store like Amazon. I received an email confirmation, but no tracking information for a long time. For two weeks, I heard nothing. I started to fear the worst. 
I thought I had thrown our money away on an internet fantasy. I emailed their customer service address, preparing for no reply. To my surprise, I got a response a few days later. It was polite, if a little brief. It simply said my order was being prepared for shipment and I would receive tracking soon. Another week passed. Then, a tracking number appeared in my inbox. The package was coming from a warehouse in Texas. My heart started to beat with a mix of excitement and fear again. The day it arrived, I felt a jolt of electricity myself. A large, heavy box was left on my porch by the delivery truck. It was unmarked, just a plain brown cardboard box. My husband and I carried it inside and set it down in the middle of our living room floor. We just stared at it for a few minutes. This box supposedly held our energy future. We opened it carefully. Inside, everything was packed securely with foam and bubble wrap. The components looked, well, they looked both high-tech and a little homemade. There was no glossy plastic or fancy branding. It felt utilitarian. The main unit was a black metal box, about the size of a large car battery. It had heat sinks on the sides and several ports on the front. It was heavier than it looked. There was a thick bundle of cables, some with alligator clips. There was an instruction manual. I picked it up, hoping for clear, step-by-step -step guidance. It was a little disappointing. The manual was a few photocopied pages, with diagrams that were somewhat hard to follow. The English was a bit broken in places. It was not the polished guide you'd get with a product from a major electronics company. This was another moment of doubt. A professional company would have a professional manual, right? But we had come this far. We decided to see it through. The first step, according to the manual, was to connect the main unit to a power source to initialize it. This was confusing. Why did a device that makes its own power need to be plugged in? The manual said it needed an initial charge, like jump-starting a car. We found a standard wall outlet adapter in the box. We plugged it into our wall outlet, and a small LED on the main unit lit up. The manual said to leave it charging for 24 hours. So we waited. The next day, the real work began. The concept was that this main unit was the harvester. It would pull in radio frequency energy from the environment. This includes energy from TV broadcasts, radio signals, cell phone towers, even Wi-Fi. It would then convert that RF energy into direct current, or DC, electricity. That DC power would be stored in a battery bank. Then, an inverter would convert the DC power from the batteries into the alternating current, or AC, that our home appliances use. The kit did not include the batteries or the inverter. That was an extra cost we had to plan for. We had purchased a set of four deep cycle lead acid batteries and a 2000 watt pure sine wave inverter. We set up the battery bank in a well ventilated shed behind the house. Following the diagrams, we connected the main RF harvester unit to the batteries. We used the thick cables provided, making sure the positive and negative terminals were correct. We held our breath and made the final connection. Nothing exploded. That was a good start. A digital display on the front of the main unit flickered to life. It showed a number, which we assumed was the voltage of the battery bank. It was reading 12.5 volts. The next part was the moment of truth. We connected our inverter to the batteries. The inverter had its own set of lights, and a small green power light glowed steadily. It was on. It was working off the power from the batteries, which were supposedly being charged by the RF harvester. But was the harvester actually doing anything? We unplugged the initializing power cord from the wall. The unit was now completely disconnected from the grid. If the light stayed on, it was pulling energy from the air. We watched the battery voltage on the harvester's display. It held steady at 12.5 volts. We left it for an hour and came back. It was still at 12.5. This was promising, but we needed a real test. We decided to plug in a small appliance. We started with a simple desk lamp with a 60-watt bulb. We plugged it into the inverter. The bulb lit up, bright and steady. We let it run for the entire evening. Every hour, we checked the battery voltage. It dipped very slightly to 12.4 volts, but then seemed to stabilize. The harvester appeared to be putting in just enough energy to balance out the load from the lamp. It wasn't charging the batteries rapidly, but it was maintaining them under a small load. 
This was incredible. We were powering a light with energy that was just floating around us, invisible and untapped. The next day we got more ambitious. We plugged in our internet router and a phone charger. The system handled it. The battery voltage fluctuated but remained in a healthy range. We spent a week slowly adding more loads. We connected the lights in our living room. We powered the television. Each time, we monitored the system carefully. We learned its rhythms. On days when the weather was stormy, the battery voltage seemed to dip a little lower. We theorized that perhaps atmospheric conditions affected the available RF energy. Or maybe the storm itself was drawing more power from the system. But it never failed completely. After two weeks of running our lights and electronics, we made the big decision. We called the power company. We told them we wanted to disconnect our service. The man on the phone was confused. Ma'am, are you moving? He asked. No, I said, my voice filled with a pride I hadn't felt in a long time. We're going off grid. There was a pause on the other end of the line. Okay, he said slowly. We'll schedule a disconnect for next week. The day they came to pull the meter was one of the most liberating days of my life. I watched the worker unscrew the meter from the side of my house. He placed a small cap on the end of the wires. And just like that, the physical tether to the grid was gone. We were free. Our home was now entirely self-powered. Now, I want to be completely honest and transparent. This system does not power everything. It does not power our large, energy-hungry appliances. We do not run our central air conditioning from it. We do not run our electric water heater or our electric stove from it. Those items require far more power than this small kit can provide. For those, we have made adaptations. We use a propane tank for our cooking stove and our hot water heater. We use fans and strategic window opening for cooling, relying on the desert night air. We are very mindful of our energy consumption. We turn off lights when we leave a room. We unplug chargers when they are not in use. This is not a magic box that creates infinite electricity. It is a supplemental system, a harvester of ambient energy. But what it provides has transformed our lives. We no longer have a monthly electricity bill. That is several hundred dollars back in our family's budget every single month. We are no longer victims of rolling blackouts. When a storm knocks out power for our neighbors, our lights stay on. Our children can always study. Our food stays cold in the refrigerator we connected. We have a deep sense of security and independence. My husband, once the biggest skeptic, is now the system's biggest champion. He checks the battery water levels every week like a ritual. He has become an expert on our own personal microgrid. The system has been running for eight months now. It has required minimal maintenance. We had one scare where the battery voltage dropped dangerously low after several cloudy, stormy days in a row. We thought we had lost it, but we connected a small, portable solar panel we had as a backup to give the batteries a boost. Within a day, the RF harvester had taken over again and the system was stable. This taught us an important lesson. Diversity is strength. We are now planning to add more solar panels to work in tandem with the RF harvester. The two technologies can complement each other perfectly. On sunny days, solar will do the heavy lifting. At night and on cloudy days, the RF harvester will quietly pull energy from the airwaves, never sleeping. So, do I believe Maxwell Chikambutso's technology is real? Based on my direct, personal experience, yes. I believe it is harvesting ambient radio frequency energy and converting it into usable electricity. Is it a miracle device that solves all energy problems? No, it is not. It is a tool. A powerful, innovative, and controversial tool. I cannot explain the physics behind it. I know the arguments against it, and I respect the laws of thermodynamics. All I can report are the results I see in my own home. My lights are on. My television works. My power bill is zero. For my family, that is proof enough. This journey has been about more than just electricity. It has been a journey back to our roots. My grandmother often speaks of a time when we lived with the land, not against it. We took only what we needed and gave thanks for what we received. This RF technology feels like a modern expression of that ancient wisdom. We are not burning fuel. We are not digging into the earth. 
We are simply using what is already there, a silent, invisible resource all around us. We are listening to the modern world's noise and turning it into light. For anyone considering this path, I offer this advice. Do your research. Be aware of the skepticism and the controversy. Understand that this is not a plug-and-play solution for a typical American home with central air and an electric dryer. It is a solution for those willing to adapt, to be mindful, and to embrace a different way of living. It is a solution for those who dream of freedom. For me, a dying woman standing on the land of my ancestors, it has given me a gift beyond measure. It has given me back control. It has powered my home, and in doing so, it has empowered my spirit. We are no longer just consumers. We are producers. We are harvesters. We are free.